when you look at a picture like this and see a family together, don't you wish it was just that simple? That it was just that easy? That, uh, that everything was perfect and everything was rainbows and butterflies? But, you know, if you'd pay attention, family is one of the most complicated things in the world. Family can get messy real quick. I, just pay, I was just paying attention to the headlines and things that were going on that involved families uh, this past week. Uh, if you pay any attention to the national media, all that's going on with the royal family, Prince Harry, they can't get along. They, they, you know, there's all kinds of drama and everything. If in South Carolina, the Alex Murdoch uh, murder case where he's accused of killing his wife and son. Uh, I think about, I read this, that this week that a couple showed up to fly and where they were at, in the terminal, they found out they had to pay it, buy an extra ticket for their child, and they left the child. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. You know, you just got to, what is going on here? You know, have you ever stopped and thought about as well how we developed our, uh, our perception of family? I, I think about the role that television and movies have played, and I go back in my mind. I know some of these names to some of you younger ones means absolutely nothing, but some of us can remember the Ozzie and Harriet show, you know, a depiction of a family. Leave it to Beaver. Everything, you know, it was such a, a good family and everything. All of those things. And then, then the Adams family and the Munsters came along, you know. <laughs> you, know you, start, you saw a different kind of family. And I think about... Uh, a, 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 chain, a television show that we think nothing about now, but back in the 60s when uh, the, the television showed The Courtship of Eddie's Father. Do you remember that one? That was a portrayal of a single father. And then a movie that changed a lot of perceptions was uh, Kramer versus Kramer. And, uh, and that was, that was, that was uh, kind of changing how you viewed uh, marriage. And then, of course, then the Cosby Show came along, all in the family, the Jeffersons, and you saw a whole different view of family. Roseanne, uh, Full House, then Modern Family. Uh, how about the Osbournes? And I'm not talking about Ozzie and Harriet. <laughs> the Osbournes. Uh, this is us and a million little things. You know, you think about and as I long for the innocence of the day of the Andy Griffith show and the Leave it to Beaver, if we're honest, very, 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 very few of us had that kind of family. That we, I'd say mine was more like the Munsters, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, that when you start thinking about what your family was like. I, I, I don't know if I've ever told you about before when I think about my family, I, I had an uncle he was really my great, it was my grandmother's brother, but we just called him Uncle Roe. And he would come down to visit us occasionally. The quote in his words, you can't get good moonshine where I'm from. And so he would come down, and my dad and him and his four-door Dodge Cornet would go off, and my dad would hook him up with the best moonshine that they could find. He would load it down. I mean, the back seats were full. The trunk was full. It was right down the springs, and he'd come back and stay at our house. But Uncle Roe, I, I, I just laugh about this. He would come visit us one time, and that four-door cornet would be blue with a white top. And he'd come back the next time, be solid blue, but it'd be a different blue. And i say, Uncle Roe, how do you change? And you look close, and he had brush, brush painted his car, he would just buy a gallon of paint and brush it. He just says, you know, if I want a different color, I'd just change it. <laughs> well, one, one, night, one night he'd come down, and my dad had gone loaded up with moonshine, and then uh, he, I came back from a date, and everybody was in bed, but I noticed Uncle Rose's car, the front bumper just tore off of it. And I said, what in the world? Everybody was in bed, so the next morning I said, Mom, what happened? She said, well, your, your Uncle Roe and your dad went and loaded up with moonshine, and when he was coming back, uh, he pulled out in the road just a little bit, and a car clipped the front end of it, tore the bumper, uh, just tore, peeled the bumper right off. The police come, and accident, everything, wrote him a ticket, never looked in the car. There was enough moonshine to put him under the jail. And Uncle Roe, he was one of those guys who said, i got to be the most unlucky guy in the world. And I said, Uncle Roe, <laughs> you know, you got a ticket, but they didn't put you in prison. <laughs> you know? But, you know, maybe you've got an Uncle Roe in your family. Maybe you are the Uncle Roe in your family. <laughs> you know, but family can get messy. I mean, it can get messy real quick. We're starting a series today for the month of February that we're calling Hot Mess. 
And if, you know, that's a new term relatively. That if you look up in dictionary, you find all kind of different, different definitions. But hot mess is just basically a chaotic or out of control situation. Never boring. You know, you can say things like, well, my, her hair is a hot mess or he is a hot mess. You know, it's just those things like that. This series that we're going to be doing is going to focus on three things. And we're going to keep coming back to this three, all, all three weeks, three times. Jacob, the Old Testament character of Jacob, talk about a messy life. And we're going to go there today, Genesis 25, in just a few minutes, if you want to go ahead and start turning there. But Jacob, we're going to keep coming back to family. And we're going to come back and always notice how God is always working. Even in the messiest families in the world, God is always working. So if you're sitting here and you didn't come from a uh, leave it to beaver, father knows best family, God's still working. God's going to still work in you and in your family. And that's what we're going to see through this whole thing. I want to set the scene. Abraham and Sarah. Abraham got the promise that he would be the father of a great nation. He and Sarah did not have any children. Finally, in their old, old age, they have a child, uh, Isaac. And it said, promise through him that he's going to be the father of a great nation. Isaac uh, grows up, marries a woman named Rebekah. Uh, she, too, has trouble having children. But they both pray to God, uh, seek God, inquire him that they can have children, and they, and uh, Rebecca gets pregnant. And this is where we're going to pick up. It's during her pregnancy in Genesis chapter 25, starting with verse 22. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Now today, she would just went, she would have went to the doctor and it would have done a sonogram and said, well, here's the, here's, the, here's the deal. You're having two. You've got twins. But in this day, she inquired of the Lord. Even as a first-time mother, she realized something was out of the ordinary. There was something different uh, from what she understood and been and told and taught about what her pregnancy would be. It says, it says in verse 23, The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Now, I don't know how much Rebecca understood and comprehended that, but this is like a prophecy, a prediction, God revealing to her <clears throat> what, what is going on and what will happen to the two uh, children that she has uh, born. But it's gonna, we're going to see that you can tell from this, there's some trouble ahead. That these two are going to be at odds. That there's going to be things out of order in, the life, in their life. And we're going to see over the decades that all comes true. Look at verses 24 and 25. <clears throat> when the time came for her to give birth, there were, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. He was born dark-complected, a ruddy complexion. Uh, Esau actually means red or ruddy or rugged. And so they named him by what they saw, that his complexion. And it says he was covered with hair. He was a hairy, above, uh, above normal, a hairy child. I've got to tell this. It was some years ago that uh, we were going to do a class, high school class reunion, and a lot of these people I had not seen in 20 years or so. So the emails are firing back and forth, and everybody's connecting, you know, be there. And so I just said, well, I hadn't seen a lot of you in a long time. Uh, and, and at that time, you know, Facebook wasn't a big thing. So we didn't know what each other looked like. So, so I put a picture of who I was uh, in this email. There was this a big guy on the beach wearing a huge gold chain, and he was the hairiest man you have ever seen. And I didn't tell him any different. I just said, and it was some people told him later, said, we really thought that was you. <laughs> you know. So, but he was a, it says he was a, a hairy man, and so they named him Esau for red. Uh, look at verse 26. It says, after this, his brother came out, and with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. 
Now, this would not be a normal occurrence in, in having twins that one is actually holding on to the heel, grasping the heel of the one going out before. So they said, we'll name him Jacob, which one of the translates, it can mean uh, grasping or grasping of the heel. Now, it also could be interpreted and later became you know, what he was like was one who was deceive, uh, deceiving, sly. And we find out that that is true. But this wasn't a marking of Jacob. His parents weren't marking him at this time that that's what he was going to be. Because how many times do we say that about our children, our grandchildren, or somebody who go, well, he's, he's a sly one. She's, she's a sneaky little, you've got to watch her. She's smarter, she's smarter than her own good. You know? And we don't mean anything bad by it. But we're going to see that these things are really just kind of prophetic of what's going to be taking place. Look at verse 27. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. You know, I love to look at families that have at least two children, the same mama, same daddy, and two children, and they're totally different. And, I, you know, the personalities and the way they, you know, and you go, how did these come from the same parents, raised in the same home? But, you know, that's, that's kind of how it is. And you see here with Jacob and Esau that they're, they're, they're two different boys. They're two different in their, their uh, personalities. Well, this is where we see in these two boys, same everything, but totally different. We look at verse 28. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Boy, did the red flag just jump up. You know, that's okay to have your two different personalities, to be, uh, to be uh, who you are, and, you know, outdoors more or a person who loves to stay inside or whatever. But when it says a parent loved one loved the other one more than the other, you know what I'm saying? They, cho- they like they chose who they was their favorite. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to jump ahead uh, some events in their lives and a couple of chapters here. But we're going to see how this favoritism l- aided into everything come crashing down, like two trains colliding. Skip over to Genesis 27 and go to verse 1. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. And Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. In other words, days close. I'm not going to live much longer. Verse 3, Now then, get your weapons, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, this was a customary thing that you, the older son was blessed, would get the blessing of the family. And between between the birthright and the blessing, he would be the head of the family. He would get more of the land and riches. He would be in charge. He would be considered the spiritual leader of the family. So this is a huge deal. And it's probably even more special to Isaac and Esau because one of the things that we skipped over was sometime back, Jacob had manipulated, cheated, bargained, however you want to say it, Esau out of his birthright. And that's the story where he said, Esau said, I'm starving. He said, well, I'll give you a bowl of stew if you'll give me your birthright. And they did it. So this was a very, very special time. For Isaac and Esau. But notice this. Going on with verses 5 and 6. Now Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back. Rebekah said to her son Jacob. Look I overheard your father say to your brother Esau. And then she fills Jacob in on everything that took place. That what's about to happen. And while he's out hunting, this is what you do. Go kill a goat. I'll fix it in a way that tastes like wild game. You'll put on uh, your brother's clothes so it'll smell like him. And we're even going to put some goat 
goat skin on your, your arms and your hands so that if, she re if he reaches to touch you, he'll think that it's your hairy brother Esau. Now this is the mother coming up with this plan to do that. Well, what you see that takes place in verse 18. <clears throat> he went to his father and said, My father, yes, my son, he answered, who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. He lies to his father. Now, every one of us in here have either lied to someone that we loved or we have been lied to by someone that we love. And you know as well as I do, that is one of the most hurtful things that takes place. If you've got a conscience and you, and you think about when you've lied to a loved one, you know how it just eats you up. Or if you've been lied to by someone you love very much, you know how much that hurts. Well, this is what takes place here. Esau comes back he, and he receives his blessing. The father goes on and blesses him. Esau comes in later, finds out what has happened. It's too late. And he is extremely upset, as you might would imagine. Genesis 27, verse 41 says this. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And he said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. In other words, he says, I respect my father. And while he's alive, I'm not going to bring this heartache on him. But when he dies, I'm taking Jacob out. I'm getting revenge. Vengeance will be mine. Because of this, Jacob has to flee. He has to go to another country. He goes to stay at an uncle's house at, just to escape the death threat of his brother. And can, keeping up with that Old Testament or that old uh, life principle as you reap what you sow, Rebecca, by all accounts, never saw her son again. So we reap what we sow. Now there's four people in this story that deserve mentioning something that I think we can all learn some. And maybe we identify differently with the different people in this story. But I want to look at these four different and just very quickly point out some lessons and some principles that we can learn. The first one, well, the first thing, it all comes under the heading of trust God. And you look at these four people's lives, if they would have just trusted God, none of this would have had to happen. First, let's look at the parents, Isaac and Rebecca. They started off so well. They both sought the Lord. They were going to the Lord about either having a family or what's going on in my family. They sought the Lord. But we see that they, they soon pulled back from following God's principles and relied on theirs, their own preferences, their own, uh, what they were more comfortable with. You know, and that's so easy for us to do. We, we gravitate to people who, are, uh, who have our likes and dislikes, you know. It'd be, it'd be easy for Isaac to identify with Esau because he was more like him. And, by, and the same with Re Rebecca and Jacob. But, you know, we have to fight those things. We can't let that guide us in how we make those decisions. And Isaac and Rebecca and the favoritism that they showed put the two boys on a collision course as if they didn't have enough differences to overcome. It put them on a collision course. <clears throat> like two trains coming at each other. They schemed against each other, Rebecca and Isaac, and they schemed actually against their sons. Their plans became more important than the plans of God. And even though it doesn't tell us this in Scripture, we don't have to be too smart to figure out the dynamic that took place. If you were Isaac, could you love and trust Rebecca? moving forward if you were Esau could you ever trust your mother again could they love each other could they get through these things now, the dynamic that took place put a burden on the two sons that would shape their entire lives I just always think about what Paul said in Ephesians when he's talking about family he said fathers 
Do not, do not exasperate or, or do not provoke or frustrate, confuse your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In other words, in other words don't say you're a Christian, but then do everything that's ungodly. That's just, all that does is confuse your children. It's just don't do those things. So that's a real principle for us to grasp hold of. Let's look at Esau. That's somebody else we need to look at. Now, let's be honest. He looks like the victim in all of these things. But if you go back and read that some of the things that Esau did, like not having any care uh, for his birthright and something that was so special to a family that he would trade it for a, a bowl of stew. He was a man who was very skilled, but he had no regard for God. He had no regard for family and principles. I remember what it says in Hebrews, where the writer warns us, he says, he says, do not be godless like Esau, who sold for a single meal his birthright. Esau, as I said, grew up and would be a man's man. Uh, he could make a living. He could do well for himself. But he had no regard for God. And he treated those things with, very much, with a lot of contempt. He was controlled by the moment and what he wanted right then. And the other brother, Jacob. Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, had had a dream. He had had a, a vision, a promise from God that he was going to be the, that out of your offspring will be the father of a great nation. Now you know if that were you, if you were Abraham, you shared that, of course, with Sarah. She knew the plan. When you finally did have a son, Isaac, you shared these things with him. And then when Isaac had his, he got married, he shared those things with Rebecca, and then he shared them with his sons. So they were aware of all the promises of God. But why, if they knew these things, why were they doing the things that turned out to be the opposite? Maybe because they felt like they were helping God along. Rebecca already knew the promises, the prophecy of what God had revealed to her. But she felt like she had to stack the deck. Isaac, the same. Esau, maybe he took for granted I'm the eldest in the family and all this stuff is going to be mine no matter what I act like. I'm going to be the, the one. Jacob, maybe he's thinking he was just helping God along since he was the youngest. Either way, a lesson for us is this. When we do ungodly things, we are not doing God's work. When our methods are ungodly, they're not godly. It's not godly work. Trust God. If all of them would just, this just got the, uh, it trusted God that these things were going to work out. Jacob learns and finds out the hard way that he's not to take advantage of people. You can blame Esau for giving up the birthright as he did so easily but we're never to prey on the weakness of other people Paul reminded us again in the New Testament he says we are free he says, but never use your freedom to indulge in a sinful nature but rather to serve one another out of love and Jacob it took a while for him to learn that when we see things happening in our world the trafficking of human beings the, the drug sales the the cheating and deals in business, the taking advantage of people's generosity or their innocence or even their ignorance, taking shortcuts to get to where we want to be at the expense of someone else is wrong. It is a sin. I said we're going to talk about Jacob. We're going to talk about family. We're going to talk about where is God in all this. And that's the exciting part to me in this is that we're going to look at one of the messiest families in the entire Bible. But we're going to see how God was working, working constantly in their family. And that's the exciting part for you and I as well. I don't know what, you, what kind of, I, we know each other, but I don't know all the secrets and what's, 
behind closed doors and all of your past and you don't know all of my past. I don't know what your family was like, is like. But know this and know it deeply and never let go of this promise. No matter how messy your family is and what you came out of and what you came from, God is still working. And he'll take you where you are in the midst of the mess. And he will work a way for you. There may be some reaping and sowing along the ways. But God will keep working. And I hope we see that as we go through this series.